sir you are audible sir yeah thank you shrinivas sir uh, and good evening good evening uh, sir yeah good evening good evening sir good evening good evening good evening everybody good evening sir uh, sir ravinder singh sir is uh, yes sir yes sir thank you sir <coughs> Uh, so, uh, due to health issues, the dean academics uh, uh, of the Gurunanand Dev University is in a medical emergency, so he is unable to join at the moment. So, uh, So, sir, if you per, uh, permit, then maybe we can start. Uh, welcome, one and all. India is a diverse country with uh, multiple identities. It is a multilingual country. The culture, the language, the food, the dressing style in India changes after every 50 miles. It is said. and it is like a mini europe so in order to bring all these diversity in terms of built heritage in terms of culture in terms of food in terms of music in terms of all the cultural uh, tangible and intangible heritage we have in india the government of india has started this unique initiative of ek bharat shreshth bharat uh, from the since 2015 from the birth anniversary of a great uh, national unifier we can say Dr. Sardar Vallabhai Patel. So uh, this event, Ek Bharat Shreshth Bharat program, in short, is an event to do academic exchange or any kind of cultural exchange. So there are some series of events which will be going on throughout the year. Today is the first such event which we are doing uh, in collaboration with Guru Nanak Dev University, which is our partner from the pairing state of Punjab. Punjab is also very rich in its unique heritage and culture. We all know that even Andhra is also very rich in the yeah, in the culture and heritage and textiles and all of these kind of tangible and intangible heritage. So having this as a background, uh, two months back, Guru Nanak Dev University Amritsar and SPAB have joined an MOU under which this events will be held. Today we are doing academic exchange in terms of planning and. architecture of both the states uh, in the next month we will have a drawing competition which will be based on the theme of unity in diversity with respect to punjab and andhra both the both the universities will be hosting this program uh, together jointly and the good amount of prize also will be given which will promote national integration among both the uh, states and the students uh, in the next semester we are having other sets of programs like film screening and student exchange so all this five a few programs we have identified uh, under this ek bharat shreshth bharat cell as per the guidelines of the ministry uh, with this as a background i welcome first of all to all the dignitaries are respected ramesh uh, sir who is our director then uh, unfortunately the vice chancellor and dean academics are not able to join but their cooperation was also important to go with this event but we have dr ashwini luthra who is the head of the planning Uh, wing in the in the Gurunanak Dev University Amritsar. Uh, then we have uh, the Dean Academics of uh, sorry the Dean Student Welfare of uh, SPAB, uh, Sandhu sir, and uh, uh, we have uh, other faculty members, staff, and students. Nearly seventy people are there. Along with this dignitary, we have two very much uh, expert personalities. In the field of planning and architecture, on the side of uh, Punjab, who will speak on architecture and planning of Punjab, uh, Dr. Ravi Inder Singh sir, and from the side of uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, who will speak about architecture and planning of Andhra Pradesh is Dr. Srinivas sir. So both of them are uh, doing uh, work in this uh, field of architecture and planning since uh, last many years. So we all are happy to have you here. uh with this uh, background i would uh, invite uh the respected director school of planning and architecture 
डॉक्टर रमेश रिकोंडा सर टू काइंडली एड्रेस द गैदरिंग थैंक यू वेरी मच गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल ऑनरेबल वाइस चांसलर प्रोफेसर जसपाल सिंह संधु ऑफ जे एन डी यू अमृतसर डीन एकेडमिक्स ऑफ जे एन डी यू डॉक्टर सरबोज सिंह जी डीन्स ऑफ बोथ दी इंस्टीट्यूशन डॉक्टर अश्वनी लोहतर हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट एंड ऑल हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ द स्कूल ऑफ प्लानिंग एंड आर्किटेक्चर एंड बोथ द यूनिवर्सिटीज फैकल्टी एंड ऑल पार्टिसिपेंट्स फॉर दिस एकेडमिक एक्सचेंज प्रोग्राम अंडर एक भारत श्रेष्ठ भारत क्लब I welcome you all, even both the speakers, Dr. Ravinder Singh from JNDU and as well as Dr. Srinivas from SBA Vijayawada for this exchange program. Both the states have in very rich heritage, culture, historical significance. It will be very interesting exchange of our knowledge, especially when we think about this particular program, aims to enhance the interaction and promote mutual understanding between the people of different states. Union territories through the concept of the state and duty pairings. That's the states carry out activities to promote a sustained and a structured cultural connect. What we supposed to have in these areas, such as specifically, if you look at it, language, culture, tradition, and music, tourism, and certain sports and other sharing activities of the best practices. Whatever we are having, these things also we can able to share among. Share between these two states. As a contribution to this unique initiative, the SPAB and JNDU have joined hands and will organize a series of events in, under this in the coming year specifically. The talk what has been taken by both the experts will provide a cultural exposure of Andhra Pradesh and Punjab among both the institutional students related to architecture and planning is going to be get benefited. especially as you know very well the spirit of mutual understanding admits the shared history as enabled a special unity in diversity which stands out as a as a tall flame of nationhood that needs to be nourished and cherished into the future that's a one of the basic ideology of what we have that we also know that we have a unique nation those when you talk about is been owned by diverse linguistic and cultural and religious threads held together into a composite national identity what we have by a rich history and cultural evolution both the things coupled with the freedom struggle that we can see that was built around the tenets of the non violence and the justice so we have a tremendous history where we can able to share together in terms of the language culture traditions music and the tourism what not even including the sports this will give you a very good exposure to both of us so it's going to be a very interesting session i wish this program is going to be very much useful to share our knowledge to all our participants wish you all the best thank you jai hind yes thank you sir for motivating us you always motivate us because of your uh, support this event we are taking forward sir thank you sir uh, so uh, with this uh, i would uh, request uh, the head of planning department of gurunanak dev university dr uh, professor dr ashwini luthra who is a very senior professor and had worked ex extensively in planning field as well as uh, allied fields i request on behalf of gurunanak dev university sir kindly address this august occasion uh thank you very much at the outset uh, i would like to uh thank dr ramesh director spa vijaywada for uh, showing us the light in the in the, in the light of the ek bharat shreshth bharat event or the scheme of the government and secondly i would like to uh, apologize on account that my worthy vice chancellor was to uh, join for the uh, meeting but uh, he was called by the state government for a meeting so he is in chandigarh at the moment and uh, dean academic affairs was to uh, attend and uh, 
because he is second in command but suddenly uh, his health has uh, fallen because uh, he is suffering from something like uh, that hb is not uh, is, is not making or is not being made in the body so he was in bad health uh, in the in the year, in the afternoon and uh, 10 minutes before this meeting i got a message that uh, he is hospitalized so in that context my apologies for that but at the same time now uh, i think this is our first first event for uh, the, the collaborative effort and on this account also i would like to thank director spa vijaywada for uh, uh, choosing spa amritsar as partner though we were uh, though the states were paired but of course the institutions selecting each other that also becomes very important and once we are on the same pitch like architecture and planning then it becomes evident that we we'll, we can do wonders and of course uh, both i would say architecture as well as planning uh, we are multidisciplinary in the nature that uh, we take note of multidisciplinary things to propose x y z thing so it is in that context the first uh, uh, topic in itself chosen for today's uh, uh, online meet uh, that is what is happening in architecture and planning discipline in the in the two states and at the same time the painting competition which is on uh, unity and diversity and i think uh, they are very pertinent and rightly said by dr ramesh that both the states are having diverse culture and they are very progressive states and once portrayed uh, i think it will be a very good experience so uh, both the students and the faculty members of both the institutions will, will be the net gainers i would say but uh, at the same time uh, i would request uh, uh, director sir uh, that uh, why not have a physical interaction because earlier we were talking that uh, the faculty and the students of your institute come here and we go to you so that face to face interaction and ultimately whatever is listed in the program of the government if we do that uh, then that will be uh, much more uh, fruitful in the sense that uh, uh, the networking would be very strong uh, i don't know uh, you agree it or not no, absolutely online, you are right sir absolutely you are right online uh, is uh, uh, sometimes <laughs> because i no many students during covid times that used to put it on and then uh, uh, not listen properly but once we are face to face then we can because as teachers we are very good face readers so we we can very well get whether something is being understood by the students or not so this is a kind of request that uh, either you come to us or we are going to come to you so that uh, uh, we have more fruitful interaction and that will not be for one or two hours that will be for whole whole uh, day so in that uh, with that note i i again thank uh, dr ramesh for giving us the opportunity to participate and i thank my university also my worthy vice chancellor because he is always proactive on these things and uh, i can share with you sir that uh, with his leadership the university has uh, got second position in the country uh, in nac accreditation uh, we have been we have been scored as 3.85 out of 4 so we are the only state university or uh, public sector university in india to score this high so the leadership is very uh, proactive and positive and uh, uh, whatever programs we chuck out in the days to come uh, uh, he he will always back us so with uh, i thank uh, dr ramesh i i thank dr ramesh for congratulating on uh, the, uh, the the achievement of the university as well so thank you very much for uh, uh, giving the opportunity to this university and as well as i congratulate uh, jay kumar for organizing this event as a as a, as a beginning uh, towards the achievements of the mou or collaborative efforts thank you very much thank you sir Department of Guru Nanak Dev University from the School of Planning and Architecture, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. And thank you for elaborating the need.
adopted of this kind of an uh, collaborative program to promote national integration between the two states and cultural exchange between the two states and the two institutes especially uh, so the the main purpose for which we are here today is to listen to uh, our very own dr srinivas Sh- uh, Shrin- taketi sir who is an assistant professor uh, in the department of architecture spa uh, vijayawada so i take this opportunity to introduce dr srinivas taketi who will be speaking uh, about planning and architecture of andhra pradesh so sir is an architect planner with more than 25 years of experience in academics research and industry in the field of architecture and planning he has completed his bachelor's of architecture from jawaharlal nehru technical university hyderabad and masters of planning from school of planning and architecture new delhi india he has achieved his doctorate degree from school of planning and architecture vijayawada Uh, on the topic related to rural housing his areas of interest are culture rural housing vernacular architecture uh, and also uh, adaptive reuse of spaces he was also actively involved in several residential commercial and interior projects in the country uh, he also got the dr sarvapat sarvapalli radhakrishnan best faculty award of 2021 and uh, also the indo asian distinguished architect award of 2020 he is an active member of uh, indian institute of architect council of architect and also itpi india he had uh, contributed to the literature of architecture through his books design of housing option for different agro climatic zones in coastal areas of andhra pradesh and documentation of traditional housing typology for the poor based on building material usage in the state of andhra pradesh he has published several research papers and had attended various conferences nationally internationally presented papers shared his wisdom with the architecture and planning fraternity so a very very able uh, speaker whom uh, we have got today dr uh, shrinivas raketi sir i request sir to kindly share with the students of students faculty members of both the institutes gurunanak dev university amritsar and school of planning and architecture vijayawada about the planning and architecture of andhra pradesh uh, over to you sir thank you jayesh Uh, respected uh, Ramesh Sir, uh, Director, School of Planning and Architecture, uh, Dr. Ashwini uh, Lutra, Head Planning, uh, J N D U, and uh, all faculty heads, deans from both the institutes uh, and my dear students. I would like to thank uh, both the universities for giving me this opportunity to present uh, uh, to present on this. Uh, topic called architecture and planning of andhra pradesh uh, and punjab by the following speaker uh, dr ravinder singh uh, sorry uh, can i can you see the screen now yes sir visible yeah thank you thank you. so i think uh, i'll i'll start my presentation yes yes go ahead uh, uh, good evening once again so this uh, uh, is part of ek bharat shrestha bharat club and uh, in coordination with spa vijayawada and gunanak dev university so i'd like to start uh, so i think jayesh i have around 45 minutes time yes sir yes sir Yeah, yeah. I'll try to complete that and just give me a, a reminder if I'm going beyond my time schedule. Uh, so, so when I was given this topic, I was just thinking of how to define uh, architecture of a place. Then I always remember Ramos Rappaport's uh, books and uh, writings. Uh, so, which is almost in the similar lines of my thoughts, uh, which I found a similar thought process. 
So I was thinking like uh, architecture of a place, like how to define an architecture of a place or a state or a region or a country. So when I was just trying to think about uh, presenting various, uh, uh, I mean, discussions about this, uh, this has stuck into my mind, like uh, architectural theory and uh, history have traditionally been concerned with the study of monuments. This was always my concern, like whenever, whenever we try to click browse or anything, we try to remember that, uh, remember about great monuments like the, uh, like the pyramids or uh, Eiffel Tower or Taj Mahal. So it is like we always talk about great monuments and then they have emphasized the work of men of genius, the unusual, the rare. So we should never forget about that and it is amazing. They're still standing for centuries, centuries and decades. Although this is only right, it has meant that we have tended to forget that the work of the designer, let alone of the designer of genius, has represented a small, often insignificant portion of the building activity at any given period of time. So with this question, I just started uh, coming out with uh, a small triangle. So if you could see the left-hand side triangle, there is uh, a small portion on the top tip which is occupied by most of the place, most of the buildings, which are monuments, which are forts or palaces or administrative buildings, public buildings or uh, hospitals, etc. So which are, which actually cater to the smaller region of a built form. So whereas the larger part of the region of the built form is basically uh, catering to the residential or the people who live and from where we start our livelihood and then go and work in these places like administrative buildings or public buildings. So this is one concern. Then I thought this is the gray patch is a large junk of uh, built form. And on the right hand side, if you see like you have uh, urban and rural, uh, uh, even if you take the context of Andhra Pradesh, we have like 70% of uh, population still living in rural areas. I mean, living in rural areas and 30% in urban areas. So if you take these both contexts, like uh, both gray patches, and I thought, I why don't I concentrate talking about architecture of these spaces, and architecture of these spaces which form the major junk, and where we people live, and where we people try to come from. So with this, I thought of, and this also is one of my favorite topic, and I've been doing uh, work on this region uh, with. Uh, uh, more of rural context or more of vernacular context. So I thought like, why not I depict architecture of Andhra Pradesh starting with the rural uh, buildings, etc. So now, uh, so housing is universally acknowledged as the second most essential after human need for food and is considered major economic asset of every nation. So internationally housing is recognized as a factor for assessment of human development and societal civilization. And these built forms embody the imprint of humans on the physical landscape. So they project the conventional as well as contemporary achievements of the people with regards to rapidly changing scenario, thereby depicting diverse positions of the intricate structure of the association between both physical environment and the humans. So now with this, I just wanted to give you a brief idea of like uh, history of Andhra Pradesh, right, starting from uh, early medieval and medieval period, like from the 3rd century to 12th centuries, like, uh, uh, like starting from the political and cultural accounts uh, from Satavahana dynasty, then the Andhra Ikshwakus who have developed their kingdom along the river Krishna, then Telugu as a language uh, which progressed and emerged as a literary medium. Then the conflict with the Chalukyas of Badami in the north and the Tamil states of Chola and Pandyas in the south. So with this, then slowly what the Kakatiyas uh, in 12th and 12th century, then the Vijayanagara were basically the major contributions to the administration, culture, religion and architecture of the state of Andhra Pradesh. And with this, now if you check like after that, the Mughal Nizams lost control of the provinces and enabled the British East India Company to consolidate the power in India. Now, uh, so now if you could see like Andhra Pradesh on the right hand side corner uh, is the present Andhra Pradesh state, which has been divided uh, 
in recent, uh, that was in June 2nd, 2014. The state of Andhra Pradesh was bifurcated under the Section 226 uh, of Andhra Pradesh Reorganization Act. And now uh, the states were formed into Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. So with this, uh, uh, so architecture always have an influence with political, socio-economic, political, uh, uh, cultural influences. So everyone knows about that. And there is always a political influence, like like India has been invited invaded by uh, Britishers, I mean Britishers and uh, like Islamic influences, etc. And whenever there is a political change, there is always a change in uh, uh, architectural character. Like we have been uh, uh, understanding about Indo-Sarsanic architecture and various other architectural styles which have been so. And when we start uh, moving from one place to another place in India itself, we come across different uh, characteristics, architectural characteristics, then you have different languages, different trust forms, etc. So it is it is basically a unique uh, country itself. So, so I would like to thank everyone for giving me this opportunity to make, uh, 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 to just talk about uh, uh, <clears throat> Andhra Pradesh. So when I was, uh, uh, talking about the larger chunk of uh, gray form. So then I've done some research trying to find out, like uh, trying to uh, figure out various literatures which states that states that uh, ethnographic surveys of building processes rarely feature in mainstream architectural history. And uh, as per various literature studies, it is evident that there is a neglect in rural and vernacular studies. And I have just tried to do my part uh, in trying to learn and understanding about various rural architectural forms of Andhra Pradesh. So Andhra Pradesh is basically divided into 26 districts. It was initially 13 before uh, around a few years back and later it was divided uh, into 13 districts with one of the, uh, it has a very uh, long uh, coastal corridor, uh, one of the, uh, uh, I mean, longest corridors which we have. And it is basically an agricultural state uh, similar to Punjab in which 70% of its population live in rural areas. And there are uh, various occupations other than agriculture, like traditional occupations and the handicrafts, hand looms and paintings, which form smaller uh, percentages. But uh, majorly it is an agricultural and uh, where, uh, and then, and when I, started uh, discussing about these then i thought like i would try to present few cases of various uh, uh, rural settlements and it is also part of my research where i've been uh, working for past few years uh, so uh, where i've tried to uh, identify few case areas like uh, various villages from different uh, districts of andhra pradesh and trying to uh, uh, I've almost visited around 45 uh, villages and after that shortlisted with nine villages trying to find out the different typologies, etc. So quickly uh, go through, if there are more uh, uh, images, I'll just try to uh, go through them quickly uh, so that if there are some repetitive images, etc. Uh, so now these are the uh, villages. And what I've just tried to identify is try to identify the different uh, settlement patterns of each and every village. So, the the like the first village has a centralized uh, and uh, cluster development, and then the second village has basically the linear uh, type of uh, settlement pattern. Then uh, another village, Etikopaka, which is a toy making village, has basically planned and circle. I've tried to bring this nomenclature from uh, adopted from uh, Singh Arvai. Uh, when the book called the geography of settlements, then another uh, village which has a linear and terraced, and another village which has grid iron pattern, linear and string with Konnapalli, which is a toy making village, and another village which we had cluster development, which are dispersed and linear and string. So you, you could see like these nine villages which I've identified, uh, they have different types of settlement patterns. So imagine like uh, within one state, uh, of Andhra Pradesh where you have different settlement patterns which we could and different and we have also tried to understand how each and every village uh, has uh, had its origin 
and trying to find out like how old the village was, how did it develop. For example, if I I'll just discuss about one village in the first the line, where it uh, it is basically small agrahara uh, initially, and later on who worked under them and slowly increased, and uh, also people from other areas have migrated to this place. Uh, and finally, it has evolved into a village. So the village was formed around a small pond and major source of drinking water and other facilities were developed radially around the pond. So each and every settlement has its own development pattern and its own characteristics and uh, based on various aspects. So I have actually tried to concentrate more on occupation when I was working in these levels. So this is the, so then it is like a, a few of the villages. And what are the aspects which I've tried to understand, like house, household, and economic characters, then different activity spaces, then uh, the designs and how they have come up, etc. Uh, and I've tried to develop uh, some analytical understanding through this. So if I just talk about one village, this is a village which has agriculture as a major occupation pattern. And whenever we talk about a particular village and the households, uh, so climatic aspects, then the uh, socio-economic aspects and occupation is also one aspect which plays an important role in the development of each and every space uh, of a built form. So I've tried to understand what happens each and every month, which is almost like you could identify the similar characteristics in Punjab also, because Punjab is also rich in its agricultural, etc. So what happens in each and every month? Uh, etc. And I've tried to identify houses where with different ownerships like 0 to 2 acres, 2 to 6, 6 to 10, 10 and above acres, try to study their influence of occupation on various aspects like space, time, material, technology, etc. So now if you check this, this is one house. I mean, trying to wonder like if you could see like uh, this, uh, can you see my mouse, uh, the arrow which is moving? On the yes, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So if you could see you can use the pointer if you want at the bottom. Yeah, it's okay. If you can see this, fine. Huh? Yeah. Uh, so uh, this becomes the main part of the house. Then you have a separate kitchen. Then you have a straw of the storage, the space where bullock carts are laid. Then you have a granary storage unit and a cattle shed. Imagine a house with the different components and uh, 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 like try to identify different aspects like the age of the building, number of blocks, what is happening, etc. Try to identify various activity spaces like household activity spaces, occupational activities and house space with both occupational spaces, etc. So this is, and you could see like in this drawing, I've tried to identify the different spaces which were actually influenced by occupation or which has been derived because there is a need of occupational sp spaces which could be combined spaces like only household activities happen or combined spaces like both household activities and occupational activity spaces or only occupational activity based spaces. So we try to understand uh, in a similar context, try to understand various typologies of houses. So each and so V1 represents the village one and H2 represents the house number two. So and most interesting thing is most of the activities happens outside then within a single room, imagine this house is uh, a single room, but it, this person has around three acres or four acres of land. And but the basic elements of the housing or the components of housing remains the same. The size might decrease, etc. And in every house, bathroom is an uh, additional element which have been added at a later stage. So that is one addition. So you could see the, uh, the house three with two rooms and most of these houses are like, uh, they are multi-purpose rooms. So they have various activities which happens indoor, outdoor, semi-open spaces, open spaces, etc. Which becomes so, uh, we have a lot to learn from uh, most of the uh, uh, vernacular or rural housing uh, uh, aspects. So you could see another house, which is basically, this is an example of a house of a house built by a government housing scheme, which is Indira Avas Yojana. Uh, but later on, all the additions are made, made to make them comfortable of how they used to live. But only one part of it is a concrete structure and the remaining all they have started uh, adding because that is the need. So this is one aspect which I have tried to address in various uh, papers which I have published, like how uh, 
uh, uh, the houses which have been uh, uh, which have been derived by different housing government housing schemes for rural areas they could address what are the real needs of the people so because ultimately they are completely changing the whole scenario so now so like you could see like uh, these are all part of this. So you have different uh, houses of different typologies, uh, which were uh, uh, seen, like uh, uh, another village, again, which is uh, agriculture as a major dominant uh, uh, occupation. So you could see like they had a ritual room here, they are multipurpose, and most of the houses have been extended beyond with, with a veranda space, where a lot of activities happen in these areas. And then granary storage and cattle shed becomes uh, other components of the households. So now if you could see uh, again another uh, typology of the house. So I could quickly move uh, uh, if there are more sketches, sketches in the presentation. Uh, then we have again um, uh, another uh, house which has uh, different uh, uh, rooms etc. Now so other than what an individual uh, uh, house uh, activities. It is also important to know about the village characteristics, like what happens. So you could see in the left-hand image, like the activities which are happening, when, the, how does it occur? What are the different spaces? And uh, open space becomes a community space and tree becomes an element where they sit and discuss. And if you could see like there are a lot of storage activities uh, which are used daily and most of the most of the spaces are multi-purpose and the loft storage provides insulation and uh, cattle maintenance and the feeder so this becomes one of the most important aspect in every household then uh, how what happens during the cooking time and how, how these spaces are occupied and what happens in the veranda which becomes a semi-enclosure space for people to uh, for various activities etc and now uh, they go for cattle grazing and they have to bring water, etc. And what are the different rituals which happens? So each and every aspect of the uh, routine life of the village or a settlement is a learning process for us. Like it is, it is in, indeed a, a great learning process and uh, how they used to lead their lifestyle, which they have tried to develop spaces of their own. They have tried to implement, they have tried to use them at different point of time. And that is actually a life which you could like. During my visits and during my visits to various villages and all, it was I've started developing a lot of interest, a lot of love, and a lot of uh, uh, passion towards uh, this settlement. So another settlement is uh, uh, the Mukalpada village. So I'll quickly go through. So if you could see the right hand side image, these are the Im this, this is what we used to do on site. We used to go, we used to sketch, we used to talk to them try to find out what are the different spaces, how are they used, like, uh, uh, and different activities, like how women were involved in different spaces, etc. What are the different materials which are used? Uh, so all this becomes an interesting study. So these, these are the on-field sketches. And when we started analyzing, we started working on this kind of thing. So like, uh, look at this. I have found a rare uh, octagonal uh, shaped uh, house and a lot of open space around. Uh, and then the livestock space granary, and now this, these bullock carts have been replaced by the tractors, etc. So if you could see, like this is another interesting form of the house, like the circular and an additional kitchen and veranda. And now I will just go to the next one. So these are most of the sketches which we tried to do it on, try to find out the different activities, etc. So now if you could see like a component, different components of one single dwelling unit where, uh, where, where occupation as a major agriculture log, you have a main house and you have a kitchen separately. And even you have a kitchen, you have both indoor and outdoor spaces where you cook. Then you have spaces like uh, the toilet, which is later addition, then a lot of equipments, granary, storage, cattle sheds, etc., which becomes a component of a single housing unit. So this is uh, like how we have tried to develop like the main house, the seating area and uh, the local terminology, etc. And what are the daily activities which they happen at different intervals of time. So most of the houses were uh, 
made of thatched roof, mud, adobe walls, doors and windows made of local wood as shown in the figure one. And the houses are purely vernacular in nature with locally available building materials. Other than the thatched houses, there are also houses with mangrove tile roofing and adobe walls uh, as shown in figure two. And the third typology of the houses which are the resultant of modernization are the houses made of RCC and uh, uh, clay or cement bricks. So which is basically uh, the most of the transformation of the houses which are happening. So you could see one of the sketches part, uh, this is uh, from one of the village. Uh, and now coming to, uh, so then I thought, why should I, why don't I try to uh, figure out some houses which have different uh, uh, occupational groups. So this is basically Kondapalli, which is world famous and which produce toys from the local uh, wood, uh, uh, local timber, where they carve different, uh, uh, where they carve different uh, <clears throat> toys out of it or different uh, idols of uh, gods, etc. So now, if you could see again, so the here what happens is people work here, people earn from here, and this is the working space, and this is a space where they live, and this is a space where they do business, and they have to live here, work, etc. So live and work. And the first case is where they live in the house, they have the occupational activities, but still they try to they have to go out to the fields and work. So you have uh, a, a little distance which they have to move uh, to their farmlands. So here, the interesting part is, if you could see this space outside the house, most of these space is used as a work, working space. Then you have a shop, then you have a storage. You could see like this house. So how much percentage of space is occupied for their occupational activities Then they have a living in the bedroom. So uh, and try to identify the occupational influence both at the plot level and also the unit level. So you have this is, uh, these are few houses where they work. Um, and then also the, they sometimes have the displays. Some houses, smaller houses doesn't have the display where they work for the larger uh, groups, etc. So uh, this is, so these are the right side images of the toys which are uh, famous. Uh, uh, from Kondapalli. So Kondapalli is a place which is very close to Vijayavana and they try to uh, uh, make toys out of the locally available wood. So the another village which is closer to Vishakhapatnam is Atikopaka village. Even these are also toys which are made of, uh, uh, which are again made with a smaller, uh, uh, with a toy, with the timber etc. So now here if you could see like the houses are very small and, and where the ground floor they have the small shop, the workspace and they have a uh, house on the first floor. And then they have uh, again uh, very smaller spaces but because they don't need much space to handle they need, they, they would basically work on this motor. They're like two people sit on either side of the motor and they try to chisel, they try to do the turnings of like this and then they come out with. So this is the space where you have to see a larger house with a lot of people who sit and work here. So you have different set of uh, uh, typology of houses again in this. And then uh, another one is where we have uh, weaving uh, as one of the uh, major occupation here. So we have again different uh, activities which happen in the weaving uh, where you could see again uh, the most of the spaces which are used and the multi-purpose space. So this becomes a living of the family. Imagine like they work here, they stay here and how. So th this is very interesting. A very smaller, I could find very smaller houses in this village. Uh, and then you have another one where uh, Mangalgiri, which is again famous for its uh, weaving. Uh, so where you could see like this is a house with a mandua or the courtyard house. And then you could see like uh, different activities of the different spaces which have been used for weaving, drying, etc. And then uh, the house number two, so you have the workspaces here, then the storage spaces here, and the drying space here. So you could see this is one of the famous uh, cotton known as Mangalgiri cotton, which is very famous. Now you could see uh, two more houses. So I have 20 more minutes, I'll just check it out. So another village with again weaving. So I've just tried to cover uh, three occupational patterns. One is agriculture, which is basically uh, more predominant and then try to uh, uh, select few uh, 
few settlements which has uh, toy making as a major occupation and weaving as a major occupation. So now the, this is so I've tried to make some comparative analysis like how what are the different how many acres they own the built up area number of family members age of the building how many blocks they have how much percentage of occupational influence they have etc. And they've tried to come out with different percentages. Now, this is one house which is, uh, we call this as Chutti, Chuttillu, which is basically a typical coastal uh, uh, residence of the uh, Andhra Pradesh. So, this is basically built with mud using cob wall technique and mixing of mud, water, and sometimes straw to create a robust putty like material. And the critical aspect here is to get the right consistency. So, Unlike thatched roofs of huts that are commonly seen, the ones of this house are overhangs and almost touches the ground to protect the mud walls from harsh climatic conditions. The shape and the positioning help to battle the houses against the raging winds. The roads leading to the hamlets are usually present with narrow pathways opening to large open spaces with mud and thatched houses. So this is one of the houses. Then we have... Uh, uh, a courtyard houses, which are also famous in uh, uh, most of the uh, coastal areas of uh, Andhra Pradesh. So we call them as Manduwa Logili, which is a kind of courtyard houses suitable for extended family to live in. But uh, most of uh, nowadays, like most of the families are becoming nuclear and these houses are almost uh, out of uh, the, the, uh, they have to be letting out to two three people etc uh, then uh, so these are basically trying to understand about different uh, manua houses and how this transformation of courtyard over the years etc uh, then uh, so this is uh, recently we have been this is around one month back we have been to this village with few of our uh, first year students so which is which has very good interesting uh, courtyard houses and the mangalore roof tiles etc uh, so I have 20 more minutes. Uh, so this is an interesting uh, image which shows the courtyard, um, courtyard houses, etc. And then uh, now, so when I have tried to understand the different uh, typologies of houses, this is the, my generic view of how an agricultural house looks like, how a toy making house looks like, and how a weaving uh, an occupational pattern uh, as a weaver, as a major occupation. So try to sketch the uh, general out outlook of how a house would look like. So what, uh, based on all these case studies, etc. So this is, these are the three occupational typologies and three types of house which, which were existing. Uh, other than the houses which I was talking about, the circular house as a Chutillu and then also the uh, Mandua house with the courtyard houses. Now, so another interesting study is transformation is one important process when we talk about architecture or when, because uh, changes are going to happen at any point of time. We have to accept the changes which will always be. Uh, so it is, uh, we can't stop any changes which happens due to various either the technological change or the change in the educational system which we are having or the change of the communication system which we have. So I in mo most of the villages, I've tried to identify one house where I could try to get what is their built form, how did they start? And this could happen only when I started discussing with uh, people of different age groups. So I could find some very old people like around 90 years or 85 years or they could just tell that my house used to look like this. Then I've tried to sketch like, okay, your house is like this. Then what happened afterwards and what happened afterwards, etc. So this is an interesting phenomena, which is happening in most of the, uh, like most of the buildings, most of the sites, etc. where transformation happens and transformation could be of any type, typology. Like if you could see this site as, a, as one family or a group of people, then in 1940, they have made the house bigger. 1970, you could see there's one line which I've made and this house has been divided by two brothers and they have made their own kitchen, separate kitchen, they have made their own cattle shed, etc. 1990, the whole thing is demolished and they made it in something else and 2019, it is like this, like people have started and I have visited this recently and this site is divided into one, two, three 
and now it is divided into five parts with all the children of both the brothers have divided them all the uh, male uh, kids who have divided them into five groups so it is like it keeps changing and we have to accept the change and one more important uh, analysis which i thought is i tried to figure out the plan forms of circular octagonal or pentagonal square uh, again uh, rectangular with thatched roof and rectangular with mangalore tile roof and rectangular with rcc slab rectangular with two floors then how that house looks like then what are the different additional factors which they had like then additions which have been happening to this then at the site level how does it look like etc and then they tried to create the percentages of like what of different uh, 45% of agriculture uh, had this kind of house with a rectangular and thatched house with a almost uh, you have uh, uh, yeah you have a veranda all around and all the other activities are spread around so this is a, a, an analysis which i tried to understood the form the how the elevation looks like and what are the different additional com uh, components which have happened and how the site level uh, development has happened so now i'll quickly go through i don't want to take time on this because Uh, this is part of my research which i just wanted to tell few students of like how analysis could be done uh through various analytical tools right so 320 15 more minutes so uh so i've just tried to uh, uh i think most of you uh, people might know or might not be knowing about space syntax method which is adopted to quantify represent and interpret Uh, spatial configuration of buildings in relation to occupational spaces so uh, i've just tried to use this method by taking each and every house trying to identify different spaces trying to identify the connectivities and distance between each connectivities and try to prepare a justified graph and have tried to analyze different spaces and different activities which could help us in knowing a better understanding about different spatial connectivities etc so which i have tried to do with uh, uh, all the houses so each and every house we have tried to analyze through space syntax method so this is one method i don't want to go in depth into this i've tried to this is part of my research so i thought i'll just show like there are different uh, tools which you could identify uh, which you could identify and you could try to help them uh, try to analyze them the next one is the uh, correlation to have tried to assess the existence between occupation and rural environment so everyone knows like correlation is analysis fundamentally based on assumption of uh, uh, a straight line or linear relationship between quantitative variables so then i took various variables and various parameters like area under occupational influence at unit level plot level plot area built up area number of blocks family members cultivation etc then try to understand the relation whether it is strong whether it is weak whether the relation exists between each and every aspect or not so i don't want to uh, create more confusion in this and then uh, try to analyze through another uh, chi square test which is again another statistical test in order to prove the existence of the relation between occupation and build form so uh, and this is most commonly used to evaluate tests of independence when using a cross tabulation so this is basically we have an analog hypothesis and how this hypothesis can be proved and uh, this is again a, a mathematical uh, analytical method where you can try to understand then uh, so trying to find out hence an all hypothesis is rejected and uh, then we may conclude that there is a significant relationship between occupation and build form so people uh, so then distribution of spaces in agricultural based houses and toy making houses weaving spaces how various spaces have been derived uh, which would how much percentage of spaces have been used based on my case studies etc and try to find out the distribution of spaces so now okay so again coming to this uh, triangle uh, where i was just talking about lot of residential housing rural housing which is just a smaller part and there are lots and lots of regions places which i could i have to visit and try to add more into this so now with with a quick 
not to say that we are not talking about monuments, forts, palaces, or public or religious buildings. Uh, so I have again ten minutes of time, which I would like to go to the top, topper, smaller bit of. Uh, I'm not going into urban, but I'm just talking about this. So now, there are when we talk about architectural styles of Andhra Pradesh, it is a state that prides the history of mighty kingdoms. Various empires influence each other, and the heritage architecture of the state depicts the consequence of this. The primary style is Dravidian, and it is blended with practices from Cholas, Chalukyas, Satavahanas, and Gajapatis. And these stone structures with intricate engravings of deities and spiritual symbols adorn most of the Buddhist and Hindu temples across the state. And the architecture is diverse, which reflects the harmony of the history of the state. So this is one example of uh, Tadipatra. Then you have Satavahana's influence. The first traces back to the building of city of Amaravati under Satavahana's. The unique. style of architecture which emphasize the use of intricate and abstract sculpture with inspiration from religious themes and this temple architecture in andhra pradesh dates to the period of satavahana dynasty and they left behind their many works of art and remains of which are seen at amravati near guntur and the satavahana dynasty's influence on andhra pradesh architecture is its buddhist mon monasteries with influence of hindu and jain temple so now you have uh, again uh, Buddhist architecture, which is seen in, Chaz uh, in Chazarala village, and then Kopateshwara temple, which was formerly a Buddhist temple, Amaravati stupa of the Buddhist architecture, etc. And uh, you could see like uh, the Tatlakonda Vishakapatnam on the right hand side, which is one of the famous Buddhist uh, uh, architectural styles. Then you have uh, stupas and Buddhist caves of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, uh, is represented uh, by rock cut caves, brick and stone built stupas, viharas, chaityas, and sila mandapas. Then we have uh, cholas introduced some new elements, and Eastern Ganga introduced the Kalinga style, as seen in Mukalingeshwara and Saripalli temples in Vishakapatnam. So these are a uh, few examples. And then we have uh, this Untimutta. Untimitta Kodandarama Temple, uh, which was built during the ruin of Chola and Vijayanagara kings around 16th century. And it is said that Potana, who lived in this place, wrote his magnum opus Mahabhagavatam in Telugu language, and which was dedicated to Rama. And then we have uh, Chalukya's influence in architecture, uh, which is basically you could see like. Uh, they constructed the number of temples and most important of them were the temples of Amaravati, Draksharama, Bhimavaram, Samalkot and Chetrol. Uh, then we have uh, Bhimalingeshara temple in Samalakota. Uh, you could see like symmetrical appearance to the whole body of the temple complex and different structural units in proper proportions were erected in their suitable places. Then this is the rocket temple, which is very close to Vijayawada. It is part of Vijayawada, in fact, which is carved out of solid sandstone on a hillside. And these caves date back to 4th century to 5th centuries and is a paradise of the history laws. And one of the preserved monuments of national importance, this attraction was originally the Jain caves and was later converted into a Hindu temple. And these four story caves are said to be found in 7th century and are associated with. Vishnu Kundin kings and the salient features are ornamental pillars, delicately carved statues, decorated brackets and well chiseled ceiling panels. So then we have this Vijayanagara style uh, Virabhadra temple at Laipakshi, Anantapur. So which shows like the different uh, sections and, uh, and we have uh, some of the uh, from again the same from Anantapur. So, like, so I would like to close here because where I've just tried to address both the buildings in the uh, triangle, and I would like to thank because I don't want to take much time. I would like to thank all the organizers, uh, Jayesh, and I would also like special thanks to Dr. Ramesh and uh, uh, 
Dr. Ramesh, who have been uh, very proactive in making this uh, 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 program. <coughs> and then uh, uh, all the deans and HODs of uh, GND University. Uh, so this, the journey is not just about nine villages which I've shown, but it's a long journey of almost 50 villages and uh, connected with thousands of people. And it's a journey of love, attachment, emotion, frustration, patience, aggressiveness, friends, festivals, celebrations, food, work, money, occupation, livelihood practices, and not more. In fact, that space is created by these people for their needs is a great learning for us in the future generations. So thanking everyone whom I met and who helped me in this long journey. And this presentation is dedicated to all the farmers who are responsible for filling our stomach, who satisfies our hunger. And agriculture is the most helpful, most useful and most noble employment of the man. And if you eat today, thank a farmer. Namaste. Thank you. Yes, sir. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for taking us through the history of Andhra Pradesh. Then how power was related to the settlement uh, patterns in the state and nearby areas. Then the need of housing in the rural areas of Andhra Pradesh with respect to beavers, with respect to farmers, with respect to toy making uh, craftsmen. And also how different social and economic characteristics of uh, housing are interrelated, especially things like occupation, how occupation uh, uh, governs the type of house in which you live. Then the transformation of housing from 1930 to uh, 2019, how the house get transformed due to fragmentation in families, etc. And uh, the different uh, analytical tools which can be used in order to analyze uh, this uh, housing in the context of rural areas. Along with that, you also explored about the architectural style of Andhra Pradesh with respect to different dynasties and kingdoms, like Cholas and Dravidian uh, kingdoms. So uh, I, I'm, uh, I would really thank you for taking us through a tour with respect to not only the six, village, uh, six villages which you were talking about or this architectural styles which you were discussing, the temples and the forts, but uh, along with that also the brief history of architecture and the evolution of architecture in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, thank you, sir. It was very nice listening to you. Uh, so, well, thank you once again. Uh, the next speaker which we have is from Gurnanak Dev University, Amritsar. Uh, Dr. Ravindar Singh, who is an assistant professor in the university. Uh, he is having 11 years of teaching research and consultancy experience. He has published uh, various research papers in reputed journals and conferences after achieving a master's in urban planning and bachelor's in architecture. He completed his uh, doctoral degree uh, with a topic related to planning for peri-urban areas. His research focus on urban design, landscape, peri-urban development, etc. He is presently guiding four research scholars in the university and uh, he had extensively worked in different areas uh, along with Punjab, that is Haryana, Leha, Ladakh, Jammu and Kashmir and also involved in various uh, consultancy projects related to social impact and environmental impact assessment. I, uh, with this small introduction, I would request Dr. Ravi Indar Singh, Assistant Professor, Gurunanik Dev University, Amritsar, to kindly deliver on planning and architecture of Punjab. So I hope, uh, yes, sir, yes. Yes, sir. Welcome, sir, sir, please. Thank you. I hope the screen is visible. Yeah, yeah. It is. Okay. So let me go and. Okay, my topic is planning and architecture of Punjab. 
so basically the broad coverage which will include about the introduction to punjab the historical background and some of the monuments that i am going to discuss on a timeline the way the things they have changed and the planning perspective in punjab basically introduction to punjab whenever we will we are talking about punjab it is the punjab that is the land of five rivers the five rivers they included satluj bias ravi janab and jhelum but at present only three rivers they are flowing in punjab and rest two they have been taken away by pakistan amongst ancient civilizations in the world with distinguished culture former punjab province was split between india and pakistan in 1947 a land of ethnic and religious diversity birthplace of number of religious movements which included sikhism buddhism and sufi schools of islam now the historical punjab and the present punjab the historical punjab which included the punjab uh, of both the countries that is from the pakistan as well as from india at okay. present we Okay, Chima, your slides are not moving. Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, yes. <coughs> sir, can you make it on full screen mode? You, you uh, blow your uh, PPT through entire screen. Your entire screen. Just a second, sir. Go to your entire screen. Yes, that wrong there you could. Yes, now now it is moving. Okay. So historically the Punjab initially it had an area of 358000 square kilometers which was further decreased by 7.1 times when the partition that taken place the population decreased by 1.2 times however the density it got increased by 5.7 times further in 1966 punjab was further subdivided on three parts on the basis of language the haryanvi speaking areas they were taken away by haryana hilly regions and pahadi speaking areas taken by himachal pradesh and punjabi was left with punjab Presently, Punjab is the only Sikh majority state in India, with Sikhs being fifty-seven point six nine percent of the population. Now, talking about the history of architecture of Punjab, the architecture of Punjab has been influenced by centuries of human settlement and occupancy. Its style is an amalgamation of various civilizations, including starting from Mughal architecture plus Sikh architecture plus British Gothic architecture. The oldest surviving examples of architecture of Punjab can be found in ruins of Taxila and Harappa, and basically the sites they are being characterized by their use of mud and stone. During the Mughal period, the Punjab experienced a surge in architectural development, which included building forts, palaces, and beautifully decorated carvings and tile work. The illustration of that is in the form of the royal fort lahore in punjab that has been very beautifully preserved and the shish mahal lahore once again in pakistan history of uh, the during the sikh period the gurdwaras they were being built in large numbers featuring distinct style of ornamentation which in turn became synonymous with the sikh faith and during british raj the colonial style buildings they were constructed in punjab such as christian churches government offices and public schools this is the illustration of the cathedral church that is present in lahore at the moment further the distinctive style of punjabi architecture is no lo no longer prominent as it once was it remains a fascinating part of punjab's cultural heritage its illustrations would be taken in due course of time the presence of many havelis or traditional mansions marks the conventional architecture of punjab with intricate stone wood carvings arcs and vaulted ceilings the havelis were typically built by wealthy land owners and brick and mortar have been famous in punjab's architecture since ancient times 
it happens to be affordable easy to use and a durable material right from the foundation up till the substructure the ornate the outer walls it is the integral part it is not only aesthetically pleasing but also gives a elegant design further else than walls the bricks they are being used for creation of window frames arcs and doorways brick and mortar are often decorated with intricate designs such as florals motifs or geometric patterns giving a unique look another important part of the architecture of punjab include the creation of gateways the way the entrances parts this is the entrance of the hall gate the walled city of amritsar the entrance of gateway of the golden temple known as darshini dehori and another concept that was very much prominent at that point was jali work which not only shielded privacy but also made a view of the street as well as the outer peripheral areas next element was the jarokhas they were the ornamental windows found on the upper le upper level of havelis or grand mansions these windows are designed with intricate carvings used by women of the house to view the streets without being seen elaborate design and colors symbolize power and prosperity signifying the owner's wealth and the concept of jarokhas it was originated from mughal influences only another is harmandir sahib commonly known as golden temple it is a open house of worship for all people for all walks of life and faiths it is having a square plan with four entrances and a peripheral path around the holy sarovar the four entrances to the gurdwara symbolizes the sikh belief in equality and the sikh view that all people are welcome into their holy place the main structure rises from the center of the sacred pool 150 meter square approached by a causeway about 60 meter long the archway on the western side of the pool opens onto the causeway bordered with balustrades fretted with marble the lower parts are made up of marble depicted right here and the upper part is covered with plates of gold the ground floor is in the interior the ground floor is having guru granth sahib ji placed under the gorgeous canopy and on the second floor we are having a pavilion known as shish mahal or mirror room designed in such a way to have a square opening in the center this is the plan of golden temple this is the actual shrine the central part and the entire holy sarovar in which we are having four entrances from all the four sides right here and four entrances right here for in the central shrine as well and a peripheral road has been marked on all the four sides for the entrance purposes and all other important monuments in its close vicinity has been depicted including ram gadiya bunga including the entrance right and the galiara road as well the next point that i would like to highlight from the architectural perspective of punjab is khalsa college it is a historic educational institute of north india founded in 1892 in the sprawling 300 acres campus and is located on amritsar lahore highway it is just abutting to our guru nanak dev university right here in amritsar it was a unique college or the educational institute that was being made during the british raj and it was having a 10 feet wide veranda on all the sides of the building another peculiar features include massing of domes cupolas multi foil arcs in exposed brickwork brackets at the corner level and parapet open or dead arcs to create lyrical play of light and shade palkis and finials used throughout the building people of amritsar lahore and other cities of punjab including rich sikh families and maharajas donated land and raised funds to build khalsa college amritsar now the point right here to demarcate based upon so many intricate carvings out of this brick and mortar joints right here i would like to highlight that the architectural design that has been created for this marvelous masterpiece is not done by a planner or not done by an architect but done by shri ram singh ji 
Ram Singh ji happens to be a carpenter by profession. But based upon his masterpiece works right here in Amritsar, in Lahore, in England, later on, he in the British rule, he was appointed as principal of Mayo School of Arts, Lahore. The next point that I would like to make is about Jallianwala Bagh. It is a historic garden and a memorial of national importance very close to Golden Temple, preserved in the memory of those wounded and killed in Jallianwala Bagh massacre that took place on the festival of Besakhi, 13th April 1919. The seven acre site houses a museum, a gallery, and several memorial structures. The point Important point right here is the entrance to the Jallianwala Bagh is via a narrow passage. The same passage that was the only entry and exit point at the time of massacre and the same route that General Dyer and his troops took to reach this ground. These are the marks of the points that were made at that point. The next important structure is a museum known as Viraste Khalsa. And uh, this museum is a modern building being designed by architect urban planner Mosh Safideh and in order to celebrate 500 years, years of Sikh history, this museum aims to illuminate, uh, illuminate the vision of gurus, their message of peace and brotherhood to promote the culture and heritage of Punjab. But the type of building structures that we have seen and the type of building structure, the profile that we are having is totally contrasting, I must say. Now the next is Jange Azadi, another modern structure designed by architect Raj Rival on 25 acres of land. The unparalleled sacrifices of Indians for the independence of India aimed to translate in this memorial complex. Once again, the structure is a modern structure and in contrast to the original architectural theme that has been displayed in the previous slides. The concircular enclosure holds the focus of the memorial layout and houses, galleries, auditorium, library and restaurant. We have 150 seat movie hall, 1000 seat open air theater, 300 seat auditorium and a 45 meter high tower known as Shahide Minar which has a torch burning inside as a sign of tribute to the fire that burnt in the heart of the fighters. Now I am gradually switching over from architecture to planning. The Punjab Regional and Town Planning and Development Act 1995, within the preview of which this Puddha Bhavan was being enacted on 1st of July 1995. The prime vision of this act was to make provision for better planning and regulating the development and use of land in planning areas for the preparation and implementation of regional plans and master plans. But right here, being an architect, being a planner and from the energy perspective, the amount of glass that has been cladded right on the facade and on all other four sides as well is adding not only to the glory, but the amount of heat dissipated in this building. Another perspective that I would like to talk about, about uh, the planning perspective of Punjab is the realm of privatization, the role of developers, private developers, I must say, in the residential townships that are being prepared. And we are having three main provisions. The first one is Punjab Apartment Property Regulation Act, under which the colonies, they are being enacted the mega projects that are being made and LOBP projects and the details we, they are going to follow in the coming slides. The first one is PAPRA Punjab Apartment Property Regulation Act. The colonies are getting approved under this act. They are known as generally in common language. It is known as licensed colonies. And right here in Punjab, we are having six development authorities. And the major share is from Jalandhar Development Authority having 315 approved projects, followed by Greater Mohali Area Development Authority that, that is the capital of the Punjab and its peripheral areas that is 172 approved projects. If we talk about the SES Nagar that is on the periphery of Chandigarh, the state capital, we are having SES Nagar then, or known as Mohali. These are the location of the PAPRA projects this is the entire 
restricted area and the industrial area on this side and this is the entire master plan being delineated in the form of the sectors in continuation to chandigarh in continuation to Moha mohali and further peripheral areas of mohali have been planned in the form of sectors only and the private developers in the outer profile of such project boundaries they are coming up with their residential projects these are the boundaries and these are the ground realities the, these projects they have been approved since long more than 10 15 years they have come up but they these roads these well, the plots they are yet to be constructed these independent floors they have been constructed but they are yet to be occupied similar cases in right here in all these sectors sector 112 sector 124 and sector 110 the next was mega projects these the department of housing and urban development it considers a project to be a mega project it, if it covers more than 100 acres of area or the investment is more than 100 crores and if we talk about the number of projects mega projects in mohali periphery area the maximum they are in the number that is 16 if we talk about residential industrial they are 6 and commercial they are 4 followed by ludhiana that is eight and commercial and industrial projects there are none other than mohali in case of panchal the type of aura the type of environment that are being created out of these mega projects in the peripheral area local planning area of scs nagar these are all the sectors that are housing these private developers these projects and i am it was first time in 2006 when mohali hills named project was being approved with only one sector but later on this this developer he enhanced its area to further eight sectors and uh, including all small small segments of each and every sector they are being made part of this project these are the extensions of those projects once again now being an architect being a planner we are here to understand how the functionality of these pockets very long elongated pockets is going to be made functional so that a meaningful harmonious development can be achieved out of it furthermore just like i mentioned that the mohali master plan is being made in the form of sectors and this is a sector and this is a sector and a developer is making some a plan for this much space leaving the entire space behind for uh, agricultural use or for a grey use or for some other use which is going to be used later on but right here something very important is multiplicity of developers in the same sector in sector 98 only two developers puma and mohali hills but in sector 99 what is happening we are having five developers striking hard to increase their jurisdiction to increase their boundary the this purple color is for one developer yellow color is for another red color is for another developer and blue color is for another developer but as per the spirit of the master plan this was not something that was being perceived this is the private developers the type of development that is being delivered to the end users is right in front of you these are some of the visuals the type of the things that are being planned developed but yet to be occupied similar case the third and the last category is for the approved residential projects is lobb projects in which land owners they become partners it was the extension policy of land pooling policy in which punjab government what it did that the farmers or the original owners of land they can come into collaboration they can come here come with them uh, with the development authority the land is for from the land owner side the loan is from the development authority the clu the conversion of land use external development charges license fees all these charges they are being borne by the land holders but the development cost is again for from the land holders pocket but the development execution would be done by the development authority sale price fixation would be done jointly by the land holders and the development authority sale of property would be done only by the development authority 
receipt will be taken care of by the development authority and, and at the end the profit sharing would be 80% to 20% 80% by the land holders and 20% by the development authority now a tentative illustration from 2014 calculations that have been made that is as it has been assumed that the cost of land for 1 acre is 75 lakhs cost of development for 1 acre is assumed to be on an average it is 30 lakhs clu edc license fees all these charges they are 25 lakhs other administrative and miscellaneous charges at the rate of 10 lakhs per acre maintenance charges at the rate of 2.5% of the total project cost for 5 years is 8 lakhs and this comes up to be 148 lakhs now if we try to relate this thing with the profit part with the saleable part when this project is going to be made implemented what is going to happen the saleable percentage that we consider for in punjab is 55% which in primarily include 50% residential and 5% commercial on an average if we assume 8000 rupees per square yard cost for residential and 25000 for the commercial what is going to happen the developers or at this moment who are the farmers or the development authority they are going to earn 193 lakhs and 60 lakhs from the commercial part the net profit comes out to be 106 lakhs and the land owners share 80% is almost 85 lakhs and development authority is 21 lakh hence land owner is likely to get profit of 85 lakhs per acre once again the pockets that have been made right here the plan has been prepared approved by the development authority but once again the pockets they are not harmonious they are not uh, covering the entire sector and in the end i would like to talk about the department of planning government of punjab after the abolition of planning commission the government of india has set up niti ayog on similar lines state government has decided to restructure states planning department on 15th february 2018 it restructured the department the restructured department will provide strategic inputs into the development process it would focus upon the deliverables and outcomes to undertake long term policies and design framework to attain faster development to monitor and evaluate the implementation of these policies suggest mid course corrections this would be a break from the past because initially this department was formulating states annual plans only or it was talking about the five year plans and was responsible for only the allocation of funds but now the government of punjab it is trying to make the role of the department of planning more strategic so that it is being in hand with the planning department with the directorate of town planning department so that the mega projects or the papra projects or the land owners become partners the way the residential projects they are coming up and in similar lines the commercial and institutional and industrial projects in due course of time the way they are going to come it is trying to restructure so that the department of planning is going to play a prominent role and the end of the day the in not only the investors but the end users who are going to be benefited out of the private developers the development scenario that is being made at this point of time they are getting benefited that is the point where punjab government is striking hard to achieve something that has been in a way deteriorated out of the privatization concept thank you yes sir thank you for uh, taking us through the historical aspects of the state of punjab the political evolution independence pre independence and the post independence major events which have influenced the planning as well as architecture in the state the various elements of mansions havelis which have been governed due to mughal architecture sikh architecture and as well as gothic architecture the different uh, famous architectural masterpieces in the state like khalsa college and very uh, which is very close to all indians that is the jallianwala bagh the virasate khalsa 
jange azadi memorial and all these monuments also sir you have uh, rightly discussed about the various policies which are there in the state of punjab and the challenges uh, and issues which are there with respect to planning in the cities like mohali or punjab and gone through certain various uh, uh, sketches and statistics and tables which can uh, make your point so thank you for giving us an insight about the architecture and the planning of uh, punjab uh, thank you sir so uh, i would request the audience the participants students faculty members to please uh, ask questions or maybe interact with our experts related to the points which they have discussed or related to architecture and planning for both the states of andhra pradesh and punjab if you have any questions we request you to kindly put it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and you may ask no questions okay jay yeah. sir i think we are first year students who are studying evolution of uh, settlements i think they are also there so anyone could they should get used to it any questions from gurunanak dev university students who have joined us Jayesh, thanks a lot for coordinating. I think it's a good number of people who have joined also. Yes, sir. nearly we had some fifteen, twenty students online in on YouTube, and nearly ninety, ninety-five students on this platform. That, that's, that's a good number in this time, actually. <laughs> yes, sir. Because this is the time uh, juries and reviews are going on parallelly. So I think this is a start. I think we'll have a yes. better. Uh, Uh, I mean, we'll have uh, other uh, setup. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. So, I, I think uh, both the schools are having the same issue because uh, this is uh, end of the semester, and uh, our senior students are busy with submission of their thesis, and uh, other classes are also going on. So, I think it is a beginning and. Uh, it is a very good beginning because uh rest i think before uh, i say something uh mr kumar will be concluding the only the submission from my side is that the students are uh, in a way busy so uh if they have any question i think uh, uh, we can send the questions to the uh speakers and then accordingly because sometimes students do not come up with the questions right away and later on they keep on asking so we can always uh, pose questions to the speakers and then uh, is is it okay dr kumar yes yes sir yeah okay right thank you kindly conclude so uh, ramesh sir uh, so i i request uh, dean uh, student affairs school of planning and uh, architecture vijayawada sandhu sir to kindly uh, deliver the vote of thanks yeah good evening uh, one and all hello dr ravinder singh dr ashwini lutra dr ramesh sir and organizers uh, and coordinator jayesh kumar and team from both the institutions 
I'm really amazed to see the exchange of academic exchange that happened today. I hope I'm audible. We'll we lost the habit of asking uh, others whether I am audible, whether the screen is visible. So we are now back uh, to that situation. I'm really amazed to see the uh, kind of presentation given by representatives of both the institutions, Dr. Srinivas and Dr. Ravi Inder Singh. Uh, additional thanks to Dr. Ravi Inder Singh for uh, covering the planning aspect also, uh, trying to integrate that with the uh, content, though it is titled appropriately, but still inclusion of planning aspect was a pleasant surprise. And uh, Dr. Srinivas, uh, we know we have known your work, but we have seen uh, your work in an additional dimension, in a new perspective, and that was uh, quite revealing and an eye-opening for many of us. I really thank all the students, despite this being uh, the uh, last classwork uh, day of both the institutions. See, the partnership has worked here also. Both the institutions share a similar academic circumstance. Both of us are equally busy. Despite all this, the honor given by all the attendees, the colleagues, students, uh, it shows that we are really serious about this EBSB initiative. And we would uh, take this forward with more events to come. And I uh, really appreciate the suggestion of uh, Dr. Ashwini Lutra at uh, the initial part of this event, encouraging either of the institutions to visit the other institution, paving way for uh, an offline interaction. Yes, that can be a very, very mini or micro NASA kind of thing between the two institutions. Uh, thank you, uh, Ramesh sir and the head of, representing head of the institution from G and DU Amritsar. And we all pray for uh, a fast recovery of your senior colleague who is uh, down with ill health all of a sudden. Our prayers are with you, sir, with, with him and the family. I hope he will, he, sir, will recover soon. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, students from both institutions. We look forward to meet you, meet each other again on a similar and even probably a better platform. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Jayesh. Can can we uh, before we close? Can we see the cameras of the EBS representatives? We can. We can have a photograph maybe with the. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's it from my side. Yes. Can everybody? Can everybody be uh, online? Means uh, can can you switch on okay. your videos? We can yes, have. Whoever is online, maybe they can just start their videos so that we can. So I just request the IT team to take a photograph of. Uh, Everybody, can you switch on your videos? Thank you. <coughs> Students, you can switch on your video. Yes. Yes. Okay. Just one more, one more second. I'll just take it. Okay, so thank you. Thank you all the expert speakers, the respected director of uh, our institute and uh, vice chancellor of JNDU, along with all the other uh, students and faculty members from both the institute. So we can conclude, sir, now I think. Yes, so thank you. Thank you, thank you IT team for uh, making this happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you one and all.